Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club of Portland. I'm Pete Heuser, your president. Today our program features University of Oregon President Dave Fronmeyer, who will provide us with a self-test of our ethical standards. You should all have received a brief questionnaire when you came into the room. If you haven't already done so, please complete that. If you don't have one, they'll have extras in the back. Our program today is sponsored by Providence Health Systems, Wells Fargo Bank, and Portland General Electric. We have three new members in the audience today. Tim Hennessy, who's Vice President of Pacific Corp. Would you stand, Tim, please? Uh, Letta Gorman, an attorney with Stowe Reeves, and Nathan Jensen, who's a patent attorney with my firm, Kolish Hartwell. Let's welcome our three new members. Well, I see one of them anyway. Next Friday on March 5th, join us at the Benson Hotel for a presentation by Dave Fronmeyer's boss, Joe Cox, Chancellor of the Oregon University System. That'll be at the Benson. Apparently, there is a conflict here at the Multnomah Club. Our board host today is Don Williams. Don is Chief Operating Officer of the law firm of Schwabe, Williamson, and Wyatt. Don will ask the first question, and then we'll take questions from the floor. And please keep your question to 30 seconds and one question, please. I'm pleased to be able to welcome Dave Fronmeyer, President of the University of Oregon. Most of us are familiar with Dave's background. He grew up in Medford and attended Harvard, graduated magna cum laude before attending Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship. He received his law degree from UC Berkeley and served three terms in the Oregon House. In 1980, he was elected Oregon's Attorney General, and he held that office until 1991. During a portion of that time, he served as president of the National Association of Attorneys General, and he received that organization's Wyman Award, given each year to the state attorney general who best exemplifies the goals of that office. Now, while attorney general, Dave argued seven cases before the US Supreme Court, and in a record that I suspect is better than that of anyone else, won six of those seven cases. So he's, he's used to being in front of a mic with pressure on. Perhaps our questioners will get, hit you with some tough ones today. In 1992, Dave became dean of the U of O Law School. At that time, the law school was ranked third of the three law schools in the state, and some said the U of O Law School was in danger of use, losing its ABA accreditation. He turned the law school around by attracting high-quality faculty and additional private funding. In fact, he attracted so much funding for the law school both as dean and as president of the university, that a new law school building is now being constructed and the U of O is rising quickly in the ranks of national law schools. Dave became president of the University of Oregon in 1994 and has been a prominent voice in promoting the university ever since. Dave and his wife, Lynn Frohmeyer, are, are founders of the Franconi Anemia Research Fund and Dave is a founder of the National Marrow Donor Program. Today, Dave is going to speak to us about morality and leadership, a very timely topic. His talk is entitled, How Machiavellian Are We? Let's welcome Dave Fronmeyer back to the City Club of Portland. Thank you very much for that warm welcome and for the opportunity to address this very distinguished forum. One of the last times I was in Washington, D.C., I happened to be book, looking through a telephone book, Yellow Pages. Obviously, I had a little bit of time on my hands. And I could not help but notice the amazing array of organizations and associations which lobby with and are associated with our nation's capital. I ran across, and this is a true story, the National Association of Miscellaneous Ornamental and Architectural Products Contractors, <laughs> the National Association of Pet Sitters, 
the National Association of Pastoral Musicians. I don't know what I would say to a number of those groups, especially the pet sitters, but I do welcome the opportunity to speak today here to the City Club of Portland. I'm scheduled to speak as our distinguished introducer just announced on leadership and the problem of Machiavelli. So without being too Machiavellian, let's start with a brief look at higher education in the state of Oregon. I'd like to give you another quick quiz in addition to the one that I hope you've already taken. What state in the West has the lowest salaries for those employed in higher education? The second is what state in the nation has pulled the most money in recent years away from its higher education system? If your answer was as close to home as it can get, you are right, the state is Oregon. Now you wonder if I'm being Machiavellian to hit you with these two premises, but there is a connection because education and leadership and the quandaries of leadership are connected historically in Oregon and in our world. And so this really is a short subject preview for Chancellor Cox, my boss, who will be speaking to you soon on this top topic. And I simply want to add my fervent plea and enthusiastic plea that you carry his message to everyone who's in the capacity to make a decision. It's that simple and that profound. I begin my remarks on leadership and the problem of Machiavelli acknowledging two points. First, our national moral failures include but run far deeper than the current issues engulfing the American presidency. Second, my offerings today will raise more questions than answer, bring to mind more puzzles than instant solutions. Isn't that what educators and lawyers always do? But I do this firmly believing that if the right questions are not raised, the right answers can never rise. In the year 1513 AD, only two short decades after the first voyage of Columbus, an intellectually enterprising young man devoted six months of his life to write a job application. He embodied his thoughts in a pungently direct letter of advice. In the letter, he argued that the end justified the means, that deceit and even murder of one's political opponents were acceptable and sometimes necessary political strategies. His counsel to would-be leaders has sent shockwaves through the worlds of political and moral theory ever since. The work was the prince, and the writer was Niccolo Machiavelli. Nearly 500 years later, as we approach the new millennium, our nation is gearing up for another presidential election. We also find ourselves at the end of what, may, or at least what may be the end, of the scandal brought about by the discovery of the very deceit that Machiavelli seemed to be praising. I will return later in my remarks to a relevant question raised by the allegations of the Star Report and the impeachment hearings. But first though, imagine with me that two possible candidates, and let's say just for fun, Al Gore and Dan Quayle, receive an unsolicited, candid, and morally shocking letter of practical advice on how to seize and retain political power. The letter is written by the same brilliant and astute job seeker, Niccolo Machiavelli, who still unemployed and in political exile, and I'll use an analog instead, dresses up and retreats each evening after dinner to the library of his small villa near Florence to reflect on history, psychology, human virtues and vices, and ideal political arrangements. Then he writes, Hi Al, and hi Dan. I'm here in the Grand Caymans wearing my best power tie and a quite elegant double-breasted Gucci outfit. The INS won't let me back in the States right now. I'm out of favor, but I think clearly, write profoundly, and have superior powers of analysis. You need me. You should know that for nearly 500 years, I have been publicly denounced by those who privately followed my precise outline for political success. <laughs> Let's not sugarcoat my formulas. Deceive, but never appear deceptive. Strike your enemies even your purported allies with early ferocity when it serves your advantage. Conventional morality is not a virtue, it is actually vice if it does not advance you. Disregard the hereafter. If you are a believer, that's your problem or your own spiritual quest. Take maximum advantage of present opportunity. Calculate, always calculate. Create your political unit here on earth now and make its greatness and that of its people be your moral victory and life achievement. All other go goals of your moral behavior are probably signs of weakness. Abandon private allegiance to them. 
but you must give those ethics complete and sanctimonious public support. And keep being seen on CNN going to church. <laughs> Al, Dan, I think we can make this deal work out for you as long as you believe that the recreation of the United States is a virtuous republic with strong and virtuous people is your aim. That is my objective without reservation. Hire me as your most trusted, indeed your only advisor. My retainer is modest and you will win. I await your answer. Best regards, Nick. <laughs> well, what do you think? Should Al or Dan or some politician give Nick a job? It's quite possible, of course, that he already has been retained. I pose this question, obviously, for several purposes. To revisit a very famous but very little read historic figure, Niccolo Machiavelli, in a modern context. To discuss some of Machiavelli's challenges to modern leadership theory. And with the understanding that as members of this distinguished club, you yourselves are designated community leaders to review various beliefs on the possible limits of personal ethics in the relationships of leaders and their followers. I will always also pose without secure resolution the most threatening question. Can you be a leader without being or being led to be unethical and immoral in your tactics? A little later I will report the results of some of the surveys that you took earlier this hour by other audiences. It should of course be interesting. And as a coda, let me raise the Machiavellian stakes. Can rules of behavior to which humanists and devout religious believers of many faiths subscribe, can those rules themselves actually become immoral when they stand in the way of the necessities of political success or the pursuit of civic virtue? Is, in other words, leadership an inevitable way of losing one's soul? Or, perhaps threateningly, are there two types of soul, the souls of leaders and the souls of others. These questions have an immediate context for me. In my freshman seminar on theories of leadership last year, I taught two dozen bright and inquisitive students. They seemed horrified by Machiavelli's brutally candid advice in his treatise, The Prince. Yet when in teams, I asked them to play a game of skill and guile called diplomacy, a game in which the objects of the team is to control Europe through periods of negotiation followed by concerted simultaneous movements of a nation's armies and navies. My idealistic students were distressed to discover how quickly they abandoned their purported ethical values. They became shameless and even enthusiastic pra practitioners of manipulation and exploitation of their classmates. Suddenly, their brief exposure to Machiavelli was real to them. They now understood the responsibilities and temptations of leadership on an entirely different, perhaps even threatening level. Further questions, of course, arise at the outset regarding private moral standards and their relationship to public or political ethics. For example, what about the ethical implications of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's pre-World War II duplicity in entering into the Lend-Lease program in which the United States gave arms to a nation under siege and in contravention both of prevailing public sentiment and our official neutrality? Or what about the heroic leadership of Winston Churchill? He lied constantly, even to his trusted advisors, and allegedly ordered the bombing of the Art Treasure and Refugee Center of Dresden. There's one convenient way out of this particular part of the ethical dilemma. So then, as now, I take the easy course of postulating that there are special rules, or perhaps exceptions to rules, in war and international diplomacy. Even here, however, remember that the United States did not have an official intelligence office until the OSS was formed in World War II because earlier high federal officials asserted, and I quote, that gentlemen do not read each other's mail. <laughs> Times do change. <laughs> but in wartime, Machiavellian deception is often accepted or even celebrated as we celebrate the massive deceptions to which the Allies resorted in order to disguise Normandy as the beachhead for the D-Day invasion of Fortress Europe. And this seems to go for Cold Wars as well as hot ones. We readily excused President Eisenhower for publicly denying the existence of U-2 overflights of the Soviet Union, even after Francis Gary Powers had been captured. But having carved out the debatedly uh, temporary exemptions of war and diplomacy on the high stakes side, let me also dismiss the low stakes side. Pickpockets, scam artists, unethical business people, spousal cheaters, liars, even felonious politicians do not necessarily pose 
what I call the problem of Machiavelli. They are just, if you will, crooks, cheaters, and as we all are, sinners. These are not leadership problems. They're simply hardy perennials in cultures throughout recorded civilization. <laughs> of course, if one of these perennials is in a position of leadership, the picture can become much more complex. Also of a different order are the small personal deceptions we employ in good games such as poker. Here, bluffing is less than Machiavellianism than it is a harmless and accepted part of the game. As an occasional player, I'm pleased to say that. But is a wise corporate CEO Machiavellian if she does not immediately reveal a daring long-term financial or marketing plan to stockholders or even to all members of her board? Is a city manager Machiavellian if he doses out the massive downsizing plan in bite-sized, politically acceptable morsels? Is it Machiavellian in its pejorative sense for leaders to unfold ideas a petal or a peel at a time? One of my friends calls this principal devious management. <laughs> so to help our analysis, perhaps we need to employ special gradations of judgment. The first would be the hardball school, employ deceptive Machiavellian conduct at all times. The softball school, be evasive or dishonest when required by necessity or accident typified in recent history by a White House press secretary who thought he could provide a, quote, limited partial hangout disclosure of past misconduct? Or are we best advised to follow the no cheat and soft heart school? Just demonstrate the honesty always of bearing your soul. But remember here the consequences of Ed Muskie's tears of rage that destroyed his presidential bid. Or consider presidential candidate Jimmy Carter's image-threatening confession to, of all things, Playboy magazine, that he had experienced the temptation of lust. Well, these are the beginnings, but only the beginnings that help us seriously consider issues of Machiavellian thought, issues ra raised five centuries ago that still cause concern and consternation, yet are practiced more often than we care to admit. Now to the second part of my remarks. What does Machiavelli tell us about modern leadership? Today, theories of leadership seem to be everywhere. They're the subjects of best-selling books and popular websites. They boost the incomes of high-priced consultants who assault us with team-building, principle-centered, empowerment-modeled, and negotiation-focused proposals for re-engineering our organizations. The list includes well-packaged formulas for total quality, continuous improvement, and personal or institutional renewal of that famous word, vision. Some of these ideas are very good. But frankly, much of what passes for leadership theory is either incredibly obvious and high-priced or just schlock. <laughs> At its best, it may be motivational, but leadership, I believe, is something much deeper. Airline magazine features, actually my best source of one-page ideas, <laughs> offer everything from eagle-emblemed, I-can-fly leadership posters for CEOs to $100 audio tape courses on personal betterment. Well, trivial as some of these notions are or may seem in my mocking way, they actually reinforce a crucial understanding. Leadership is not, I believe, an innately born capacity. It can be nurtured and it can be learned. And I salute the genuinely honest entrepreneurs in this niche. So let me continue the dialectic of how I understand leadership. In the 1970s, James McGregor Burns, a biographer of president, presidents and a brilliant social scientist, wrote a seminal book which contains this definition of leadership, and prepare yourselves because it's lengthy. Leadership over human beings is exercised when persons with certain motives and purposes mobilize in competition or in conflict with each other, institutional, political, psychological, and other resources so as to arouse, engage, and satisfy the motives of followers. Well, here are five immediate comments as those words sink in, or perhaps simply sink. <laughs> the first is that the description obviously sags tediously from the weight of its effort to be inclusive. But second, Burns frees us from the profoundly simplistic earlier models that made the concept of leadership exclusive to politics, mili military affairs, or heroic biography. Leadership, he asserts, and I believe, is in and around us all. 
Third, though, we, we hear in these words precious little about the inspirational release and mobilization of human potential that we feel as we experience leadership. Burns defines leadership as over people instead of with people. Fourth, the emphasis on the relationship of leadership to the dynamics of followership liberates us from earlier and older stereotypes of the man on the white horse theory, gender, color, and animal chosen from stereotypes, of course. The leader-follower relation is a major rediscovery in modern leadership theory. But that leads to a fifth critique, or at least a critical question. Is there a central morality to Burns's definition of leadership? Let me recapture my central theme. Might Machiavelli come out even better by comparison? Burns denies that Adolf Hitler could be a leader within his definitions. But my students and I concluded that Burns was simply self-contradictory on this point. Has Burns defined an ethical example or is the leader simply so in touch with his followers that each is satisfied because magical talents have appeased special interest concerns of the followers? Do team management and group empowerment schools of theory suffer from this same defect? Machiavelli would say, yes, they do. They do suffer from that defect. He would describe those goals as amoral and even as morally unworthy. He sought to focus leadership on the participatory civic community as an ethical ideal. He knew that people had the potential to do good, but also that they were hopelessly fickle. Leaders can seduce temporarily the affections of followers, but Machiavelli asserted that a continuous appeal to people's basic natures would be a destructive tragedy for the kind of community that a prince should seek to create. Machiavelli, in other words, would rather have the leader sin that had the community lacked sustained, robust virtue. Well, how do other leadership experts view the issue? Let's take a stroll down the aisles of any local bookstore and look in the leadership section. Exhaustive and increasingly exhausting literature abounds, in part because leadership theory has expanded from the traditional domain of political and military strategy. It now includes corporate and business CEO and wannabe CEO success formulas and overlaps the growing and lucrative markets of literature on personal growth, group empowerment, gender assertion, and even, I'm afraid, success, sexual success. I've looked at the books out there and I have four concerns. First, almost none of the best sellers even contains an index reference to Machiavelli. The Renaissance leader of leadership theory has disappeared utterly without a trace. Second, the indices often cross-reference values, missions, vision, ethics, and principles as though these are interchangeable concepts. They are not. An organization can have a clear mission and a long pedigree of values, but the combination may simply be used to exploit the planet, to devalue one's employees, or to worship self-indulgence. Hitler had a vision of racial superiority and geographic hegemony. I read Mein Kampf decades ago, need I say more? Jim Cousins and Barry Posner, in their book, The Leadership Challenge, one which my students and I read and from which we've learned much, develop conclusions from a large and persuasive database of empirical studies of the characteristics of admired leaders. And their study, which I believe has social science validity, is actually reassuring. Ethics and credibility are at the very top. The list was headed by honesty, then forward-looking, then inspiring, only then competent. Intelligent, courageous, imaginative, and mature are rated near the bottom. Ronald Heifetz, in his wonderful book, Leadership Without Easy Answers, argues that leadership requires us to take sides in discussing and asserting values, as does Stephen Covey, who has written thoughtfully about principle-centered leadership in his best-selling and ethically-centered Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. These imaginative writers each tell us that leadership must possess an ethical centerpiece or it is not leadership at all, and that leadership cannot be confused with shared values or missions. But my concern is that the formulas for success of most of these theorists, and many of them are really very good, do not help us to deal with the outlier. And I hope you heard my deliberate play on words. Some person, group member and colleague, 
may be on the fringe, a liar, genius, rebel, or lunatic. The person may be untrained, untrainable, or ignorant. And almost certainly that outlier will not function within the construct of the organization, even after its team building and value sharing enterprises are complete. And unfortunately, that outlier sometimes can wreck everything. It is a sad truth of human organizations that not everyone can be brought on board. Some fellow citizens, teammates, or employees, perhaps many of them, may be dysfunctional according to our terms. Potential traitors abound. Team or nation or even family building exercises may take too long in the face of short-term allegiances, perhaps even lifespans. Indeed, do people have any sustainable interest in shared civic pursuits? You undoubtedly believe this or this club would not exist, but that at least is an open question if one is to read the polls today. So a hard question for our new theorists of ethical leadership is whether they give us any coherent strategies to combat or include these outliers, the citizens among us who seem to have no stake in consensus or the building of shared goals. Certainly anyone here in a leadership position has outliers in his or her organization. Shakespeare wrote a sonnet about the quality of mercy. How might he or we write about the quality of dealing with a jerk? You see, Machiavelli wrestled with this problem. He was a realist and a pessimist. And so he assumed the worst and advised his leaders to act consistently on that assumption. Well, my fourth concern centers around the cynicism that sometimes also parades itself as leadership theory. Not all of the current liter litership, uh, leadership literature is oriented to values and warm feelings of shared mission. Donald Trump gained international acclaim in the 1980s touting his hardball, winner-take-no-prisoners philosophy and the art of the deal. Then there's the New York Times bestseller by Wes Roberts, Leadership Secrets of Attila the Hun. Chainsaw Al Dunlop, CEO of Sunbeam, wrote a book of his downsizing and employee trashing strategies shortly before the Sunbeam board fired him for driving the company into the ground. So these secrets are cynical, double-edged, and quotable, but they possess overtly little as a consistent ethical center. And frankly, taking the current prize for macho egotism is a little treatise by Richard Marchinko called Leadership Secrets of the Rogue Warrior, a Commando's Guide to Success, written by a former Navy SEAL commando who, according to his own dust jacket promotion, expands his war stories to consultations with Fortune 500 companies and smaller businesses. Interestingly, of all the modern literature that I've scanned, Marchenko is, is one of the few who even cites or quotes Machiavelli. That's too bad. I was left with one dominating thought after reading The war, Rogue Warrior. A good SS officer could easily have worked within the leadership qualities and techniques that the author outlined. So what have we learned so far about the problem of Machiavelli? The late Sir Isaiah Berlin, a lecturer with whose thought I was rapidly engaged 30 years ago when I was a student at Oxford, developed a path-breaking and all too little known thesis on Machiavelli. Berlin concluded that Machiavelli developed and then embodied a radical break from the pre-existing Western moral tradition. Contrary to other religious and ethical schools of thought, Machiavelli's passionate focus on the role of the leader carries with it the underlying judgment that all worthy values are not cohesive and compatible. The good, the true, and the beautiful are not of one piece. In Machiavelli's world, Berlin asserts, Worthy values clash. If one believes in political leadership as a means to civic greatness, then doing what others may consider as evil is not evil at all. In fact, one might even read Machiavelli to be saying that in his moral universe, it is evil not to do evil if the price is loss of power to do a greater good. As I suggested at the outset, in Machiavelli's world, there are two coexisting and incompatible codes of ethics those which leaders must follow, and those which may apply more generally to other citizens. In a similar note of fatalism, resignation, or blunt realism, Loyal Rue, who is a senior fellow at Harvard Divinity School, wrote a book called By the Grace of Guile, The Role of Deception in Natural History and Human Affairs. Rue says this about political deceit, and I quote, politicians have interests, all human beings have interests, 
Whenever people have interests, it gives them something to protect. So people, including politicians, lie to protect their interests and those of the people they care about. Surely Bill Clinton is no exception to this. But now, having accorded Machiavelli his due, or some of it, consider a second conclusion. Machiavelli's theories simply won't work. At least they won't work with the completeness that he once advocated, given the size and technical advances of modern nations. Ruling a small city-state in Italy with a trusted cadre of henchmen is one thing. But acquiring and exercising power in the age of modern media makes the possibility of extended deception very unlikely, if not impossible. The Secret Service and shortly thereafter hundreds of websites record and report the precise number of White House visits of a junior intern. And soon we know everything that happened, whether we want to or not. And this is exactly the miry morass in which the president found himself. Regardless of how you feel about the entire affair, the whole drama, from internet outings to secret tapings, star report to leaked testimony, denial and apology to impeachment hearings and no conviction, it all calls into question whether Machiavelli has been overthrown, not by morality, but by mass media. Efforts to protect personal privacy are nearly impossible in a world where thousands of media ears are trained on every sigh and whisper, the way our giant radio satellites are aimed at the stars, waiting to hear anything. If you listen long enough, you're bound to hear something. And lately, we've heard everything. And of course, if you follow Machiavelli, you have at a minimum two other major problems. You must also always sleep with one eye open. If people know you will hurt them, they will try very hard to hurt you first. And because you place a special premium on the preemptive strike, you always must observe, calculate, and act with complete precision. Machiavelli leaves us no latitude for personal calculational error. There are, of course, much deeper problems with Machiavelli's guide for leaders, problems that slide us down the ethical slippery slope very, very quickly. How do you know when an end is grand enough or attainable enough to justify brutality and deceit? And how does this calculus play into every human being's infinitely easy capacity to rationalize pleasure or productive actions? Means and ends are not separate, as a wise professor once told me, because means usually enter into and condition the outcome of the ends. And of course, remember that if you're concerned about your salvation in the hereafter, which Machiavelli was not, there is something far more eternal about conventional ethics. On two points, however, Machiavelli seems to me to make enormous sense. The first is that the leader's ability to calculate the consequences of his or her actions must itself be assessed as part of the morality of those actions. In this century, millions of lives have been lost because leaders claiming the view, virtue of pure intentions have failed accurately to estimate the human consequences of what they set in motion. Machiavelli's contribution to this moral calculus is something that we should honor. Hell is paved with good intentions and incompetent execution. And second, never forget the followership part of this equation. Machiavelli embraced cruel tactics because he saw his own fellow citizens as imperfect and often lacking in virtue. So leadership in that sense really is a two-way street. We should be particularly wary of the all too popular proposition that we, the led, are superior morally to them, our leaders. The problem of Machiavelli is not just what he was, it also is what we are. The survey results of other organizations to which I've spoken are revealing and perhaps disquieting. In fact, I have found that the older and more experienced the audience, the more trusting that they are. The highest scores for high Machiavellianism on this survey instrument developed by two political scientists in the 1970s are actually the high school and young college students to whom I've administered it. And that carries with it two messages. Either they will grow out of it, or there is a generational gap formed by the lack of idealistic leadership for them to model that is and is having an enormously deleterious effect on this nation's future. 
I suppose there's a special point to the we of all of this, we the followers. Because interestingly enough, those of you who are students of the American Constitution know that the founders of the American Constitution had studied Machiavelli and had views of human nature which were remarkably similar to those that underlay the prince. The founders saw corruption of civic virtue as likely. They feared tyranny profoundly, and they frankly worried how long their construction of a new government would last. They chose, though, not to put their faith in princes, even though they accepted human vice as a given. They did something very different to counter it. They divided power among three competing institutions of national government. They separated governmental power, held out for no heroes, and counted on checks and balances to deter tyrants. So far, 210 years later, it seems, even with all the creaks and groans, still to be working. So now to my final difficult questions. Can you be a leader without being unethical and immoral in your tactics? Or must you pay Machiavelli's high price for his brand of leadership? As a first response, remember that this is not Machiavelli's world. We do not live in a small city-state ruled by a single powerful family, but instead in a vastly more complex world painted in shades of political gray. A recent book entitled The Paradoxes of the American Presidency, written by Thomas Cronin, president of Whitman College, and one of your recent guests at this distinguished forum, addresses this question head on. Citing a number of paradoxes, the authors of his book focus on the particular dilemma in Paradox 3, and I quote it. We want a decent, just, caring, and compassionate president. Yet we also admire a cunning, guileful, and on occasions that warrant it, even a ruthless, manipulative president. In other words, we seem to want someone who is nice, humane, and kind, except when all the cards are on the table and the stakes are high. Then we want a winner, regardless of what it takes. So perhaps we'll be forced to accepting F. Scott Fitzgerald that, quote, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time. Or as the authors note, we may find some insight into Casey Stengel's capturing the essence of the paradox when he noted that, quote, good pitching will always stop good hitting and vice versa, <laughs> Listen to the words of Andrew Sable, a Harvard doctoral student several years ago who won the Leo Strauss Prize with his dissertation on politics and ethics that concludes with the following advice. To ask what political leadership should be is to ask the wrong question. We should ask instead what kind of politics should be practiced for the given purpose in a particular sphere by a certain sort of character if the constitutional order is to fulfill its promise. This does not imply that anything goes, but it does imply that many different political activities that actually exist might be valuable for reasons specific to an office and should be judged by those reasons rather than by ones that everyone could accept. To move from single standards of judgment to multiple ones is once again to value sympathy, toleration, and reality above the ideals that are not of this world. This might sound Machiavellian, but actually I believe Machiavelli would not have approved. To me, the real issue in leadership and the challenge of Machiavelli is not the ethics of murder and deceit. It is in much more in the dangerous immorality of civic disengagement and indifference. This is true even in our current political dilemma. The real danger is in not trying to have ethical standards and in giving up. Not caring is worse, in my view, than being wrong. The struggle must be engaged, and that truly is the Machiavellian struggle that we face. We can't ignore it today. It's hard to disagree with the argument of Vance Morrow in the recent issue of Time magazine when he said that Quote, something in public life seems permanently changed, permanently lost. Have we moved from hope and trust to disgust and disengagement because of Machiavellian <laughs> examples? Will we discover that the price of doing the people's business is total cynicism by the people? Can we, as a democracy, and all that democracy means, disengage ourselves from this process without paying a terrible price? Arthur Schlesinger Jr. recently wrote how the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, quote, left the presidency, one in which leadership languished for more than 30 years, fatally weakened until the 
presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. Perhaps the answer, strange as this may sound to you, will be the rise of more people, or at least the acceptance of more people like Jesse Ventura, who found in his own way to, in his words, quote, entice the disenchanted voter back. But certainly, whatever is said, we do not have to tolerate the levels of deceit to which our polit political system seems to have been accustomed, sort of the way they say a frog will sit gradually in heating water until it is boiled and cooked. And it is in actively not tolerating that deceit that we must each answer the problem of Machiavelli. In the year 54 AD, the Roman poet Juvenal posed the bas basic issue of governance and personal responsibility as a question. Sid quis custodiat ipsos custodes. Translated, it asks, but who will watch the watchers? Who will guard the guardians? To that vital question, Machiavelli gave a cynical, authentic advice, a secretive, well-advised, and ruthless leader. But our answer is not in a prince. Instead, it is here within ourselves and our willingness to grapple daily with the problem of Machiavelli, the problem of evil, the problem of human fallibility, the problem of aspiring always to do better in an imperfect world. Oh, yes. Should Al or Dan hire Nick as his consultant? The question is yours to answer. Machiavelli still waits to be employed. The, prison to, the, the prince to whom he wrote this classic job application never hired him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. And I'm not going to ask the question that everybody wants me to, and that's when are we going to see your name on the ballot for public office again? But I'll, I'll refrain from that. <laughs> Machiavelli said, a prince is selected through the favor of his fellow citizens, and genius or fortune is altogether unnecessary, but instead a happy shrewdness. In light of this premise, could you comment on the recent Attorney General's opinion that state legislators themselves, rather than the Oregon ethics opinion, will co determine what constitutes a, a financial conflict of interest? Well, I haven't read the opinion. I've only read reports of it. Uh, I must say I was surprised by it, because during my tenure as Attorney General, while I'm not sure that question arose, there were legislators uh, whose actions in the Legislative Assembly were found to constitute conflicts of interest and who were sanctioned by the Ethics Commission, and who, given the currents of the time, as I review them in my own political history, probably would not have been disciplined by the Legislative Assembly itself. It is simply very difficult to hold a trial over a people uh, uh, upon whose votes you may depend for your own political ses uh, success the next day. I see at least three former legislators in this audience who are now nodding vigorously as I utter those words. Matteo Lucio, City Club member, how would you recommend that we go about judging and choosing at the ballot box between two leaders if, say, we considered one to be unethical, maybe a lying, cheating predator, but whose values politically we might agree with on environment, women's rights, or whatever, and another one who we might, uh, whose ethics we might agree uh, find uh, impeccable, but whose values we disagree with, and does it depend perhaps on the office, whether it's you know, a city councilor in a small town or the president? And just one thing I'd like to note is on the, the uh, role of the media as far as you know, checks and balances, we may have the logs of the interns' movements in the White House. We don't have the transcript of the conversation between the president and the corporate leader or foreign leader. And so we have certain details, but... That, that's two questions. I think you've actually... The, the second question was a point uh, with which I actually don't uh, disagree. Uh, and that causes me to have forgotten your first question. <laughs> the, yes, all right. <laughs> the well-intentioned leader and the effective corrupt leader. Uh, it is a very slippery slope. Uh, I think any time we, we tolerate someone whose character shows major flaws, the more important the office, the more significant it is, in my judgment, that, that personal standards also be those that we are willing to tolerate in public. And I say that because, because the, the widening circles of, of, of causation, of cause and effect, uh, flow from people's distrust 
of everyone because they, the, the behavior even of, of the successful unethical person uh, is either modeled by or known by people and especially young people. Uh, I detest some of the dinner table conversations I've had to have over, over the last uh, two years with, with my children and I hear that commonly echoed and I know what the poll numbers are but I think the long-term corrosive effect can be far more damaging than the short-term impact we have on values that we may cherish. And so that's why, to me, line drawing is very, very important. Hi, I'm Fran Lowson. I'm a city club member. Pardon my voice. Um, as a young nonprofit professional in this community, I'm awed at the idea that people are actually starting to really value nonprofit professionals for the work that we're doing in a very professional sense. But at the same time, there are those other business ethics that sometimes creep into our sector that I don't think have always been present um, in the work that we do. That paired with the civic disengagement of people my age, I'm 27, um, tends to kind of really just depress me and make me wonder how I can help my peers um, through this period of time. And I was wondering if you had any insight into that. Thank you. I, th I think, like all problems that seem insoluble, if you have to do it in, in one great big bite, is to break the problem into bite-sized morsels and start with your own neighborhood. Uh, and, and I think actually we're seeing some happy evidence of the reemergence of a, of a civic engagement uh, that's, if not quite literally at the geographic uh, neighborhood level, at least is embodied in, in people's philanthropic efforts in how they spend their time. I mean, when, when you can get thousands of Oregonians to clean up 300 miles of beach in a single eight-hour period of time, uh, you are seeing something profoundly important about people's sense of obligation to place into the future. And I use that simply as a metaphor for many activities that are occurring uh, right, right uh, b beneath our, our, our scopes because, frankly, with the media's fascination with, with the scandal and evil at the national level, we may be ignoring the good deeds that can occur on a human, tangible level in our local areas. So when in doubt, start with something that's local that you can see and that sets an example that's inspirational for others. Hello, my name is Bill Parrish. I'm a city club member. And I'd also like to ask you what you might do under a certain situation. Let's assume you're managing a large mutual fund and you discover a huge classic financial pyramid scheme involving a large beloved US corporation, one that advertises aggressively. What would be the forum you would choose to perhaps discuss that situation? <laughs> On the manager or on the board you're, of directors? You're managing a, a large mutual fund, or even as a university president with endowment issues, you become aware of this large financial pyramid scheme, completely unknown to the public, that they would be outraged over if they were aware of it. Well, the first thing I do is investigate it, and the second thing I do is make sure that there are proper disclosures. Um, uh, and that's, that's, I think, is, is, a, is a case where both prudence and ethics coincide, because one makes it only worse by concealment. A particular forum? I, I suppose the forum that, that you are positing would require you to go to law enforcement agencies, and I would do so. Uh, Andrew Wheeler, I'm interested. I thought I heard you say earlier that uh, leadership can be learned, and I, maybe that was because uh, you can learn the hoops and then you can lead better now. But I'm thinking of uh, <clears throat> the first leaders that we know of, uh, perhaps chimpanzees, and it was the strongest chimpanzee, the one who had the harem, who kind of, and maybe the smartest one, who became the leader, so that maybe there's something inherent there. And then if you read the Old Testament, there are other leaders that might reinforce that uh, idea. So I'd like to know more about that. Well, when I talk about this with my students, and I, and I freely admit that, that the model I'm going to explain isn't mine alone. It, it comes from other sources. And knowing that I'm in the academic world, if you take from one source, it's plagiarism. If you take from two or more, it's scholarship. So I'm <laughs> now giving you uh, 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 I, I think you can actually see leadership or management uh, in, in an ascending hierarchy uh, from the most common and least efficient to the least common and most efficient. Uh, and the model, if you can imagine it, uh, and it's, it's a heuristic model, starts out with a model of brute force, which is you do what I'm telling you to do or I will hurt you. And that's what the chimpanzee does. And the problem with that is Machiavelli's problem. You have to stay awake 24 hours a day because people will hurt you back. And you have to be giving orders 24 hours a day because uh, when you stop giving orders, people stop doing things. So even though it's instinctual 
and maybe even genetic, it is very efficient, inefficient, especially for running large organizations. A second ascending level from that is what we call stripes. You, know, you do what I tell you to do or ask you to do because I have two stripes and you have one. Uh, that's a sense of hierarchy that uh, brings more efficiency because people at least aren't living by fear. But it doesn't necessarily bring any notion of expertise. And you can follow the person with two stripes right over a cliff because it doesn't mean that that person has any innate capacities to lead. But it gives you hope that there will be seniority. The third level, according to this model, is that of expertise, which is you do what I ask you to do because I know how to do it better than you, and you can learn from me. And that's one where there's a high degree of efficiency because, in fact, it's the learning organization. It's, it's part of a model that tells us that we can aspire, that we can learn to be better leaders, that we can learn these skills. And the only problem with that expertise model is that if we run out of experts or the need for expertise changes as our world changes around us. And the final highest and most rare but most efficient form of organization is that which actually runs itself by esprit, where people know what to do, where leadership almost goes back and forth uh, in, a, in a lateral form because people have such a level of trust and confidence in each other and because they have such a deep and rooted shared sense of mission and value and ethics that the organization can virtually function without command at all as long as the direction is agreed. That's very rare, it's very efficient, uh, and it's very exhilarating when you're part of an organization that is that. That kind of organizational development cannot exist without the kind of ethics that Machiavelli would have derided. Uh, Dave, I'm Ted Falk, member, and uh, I wanted to thank you for exercising your leadership over these uh, many years in the state of Oregon. I think we're very proud to have somebody as, as thoughtful and highly educated as you at the, at the helm. I, I wanted to ask about a, a sort of leadership that you yourself aren't known for exercising that is, and, and that Machiavelli never had a chance to see, which is the leadership of complex, large business organizations, something I know you've thought about. Um, uh, many of the most cynical examples that you gave in your speech are from uh, books, uh, the Barnes & Noble type of advice for business leaders. Do you think there is something distinctive about leadership of business organizations that necessitates or gives rise to this sort of uh, cynicism or Machiavellianism, <coughs> or is there an ethic of, of leadership in business organizations that, that you could recommend? Well, there's a popular notion that um, the CEO focused on the short-term profits or the, or the good Wall Street showing is the successful one. I, I think some of the deeper of the books, uh, both of which I mentioned and, and which I didn't, would actually reinforce the assertion of Kunz's and Posner that, in fact, having a leader who is perceived as ethical is indispensable to the long-term success of that organization. Uh, and that, in fact, uh, dishonesty is a contagious disease. Once there is corrosion at the top, it's smelled very quickly. And it permeates the organization, and it makes it dysfunctional. And even though one can have uh, short-term successes under that kind of brutal strategy, my guess is that the, that the long-lasting corporations uh, and organizations follow a very different ethic. And I have some empirical evidence for that. Uh, there's a book called Built to Last, the <coughs> authors of, of, of which I've unfortunately just forgotten, but they're both the Stanford uh, uh, Business School professors, did long-term studies of long-term surviving uh, corporations that are truly as successful in every bottom line respect, including stock value, uh, employee satisfaction, and so forth, and compared that against uh, companies that started out about the same time, uh, but have had far less success. They're not dogs, they're just not great. And among the secrets of the built to last companies are this deep seated sense of value that what we do is important, that what we are making, whatever the product is, and sometimes the product changes radically over time. They have a, a deeply felt allegiance to each other and to the, the, the central goals and long-term goals, not merely short-term goals, of the organization. Uh, it's a powerful book. I, I think it's an authentic and, and well-researched book and is some evidence that the survivors do at least have, if not always what we would call Ten Commandment ethics, at least have some sense of internalized value that's deeply shared. I, I can't resist uh, commenting on the authors of re-engineering 
a great theory that earned the, the authors of that term and of the book bearing that name millions of dollars in, in consulting fees and book royalties. And a few years later, they confessed that re-engineering wasn't working. And the Wall Street Journal, in an article that I wish I'd saved about two years ago, quotes one of them as saying, we forgot about the people. <laughs> Good heavens. That's a fairly basic lapse of memory. Uh, Charlie Davis, member. <clears throat> I thought about asking you about the group in uh, Eugene called the Anarchists, but I won't. Uh, I'm, I'm, I recognize that the founders had in mind separation of powers as a uh, possible cure for the uh, corrupting power, the cor corrupting power of, of gov government by imperfect people. I'm w wondering what your view is of uh, the move in the Oregon State Senate to provide uh, the Senate with uh, approval powers for appointments to the bench by the governor. Uh, I'm in principle not in favor of it. Um, I actually, as, as a matter of going way back, uh, believed that it was a mistake to have legislative confirmation of executive appointments on the theory that the, the capacity of the executive branch to be accountable clearly for its own actions depended upon the executive's choice for good or for ill of persons who would serve that branch. And I feel the same about the judiciary. I, I believe that it, it, it ought to be independent. Uh, and that if there is uh, some change in selection of members of the judiciary, that it ought to be something like the Missouri plan, something for which I and eight other Oregonians voted some years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have one last question. Chad Orloff, City Club member. Thank you, Dave, for your comments today. I'm, I'm particularly appreciative. Uh, I was actually quoted last week by Charlie Hales when he spoke here um, because I'm sponsoring a bill in the legislature now on civics and uh, historical education for Oregon students. And my question relates to your comment about followership in particular. It strikes me from reading history that the problem with a lot of bad leaders is it's not them themselves, but the people who have put them in that position and their inability to judge character. And what, in your opinion, as an educator, can be done in Oregon to raise the level of civics education, civic education, amongst particularly younger students? And I know there's not great yeah. models out there for the well, future. Yeah, you're a historian, Chad, and a good one. So you, you know that there's history and then there's history. Uh, there's civics and then there's civics. I, I, I think the kind of learning that, that engages students in the actual exercise to the extent you can make it realistic of some of the real dilemmas that they will confront in their later lives is in fact something that increases their moral awareness. And in fact, I believe that there are studies that show that just as leadership can be learned, so can moral judgment actually be improved uh, as people reflect, think, act, discuss, and talk. Uh, I, I hope that we, even though we know that we lack human perfectibility, I hope that we all subscribe to the notion that uh, whether we get older uh, chronologically, that at least we can get both wiser, more ethical, and be better leaders. And incidentally, be better followers. Uh, th there, there is no single person who all of his or her life is a leader or a follower. And to understand that we all possess the ethical responsibilities of leaders at some time or another, and to vow that when, when we're past that challenge that we will do our best uh, is, I hope, the assurance that we can teach somehow. Thank you very much for the capacity to be here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, one of the things I thought of while listening to you is that Leonardo da Vinci lived in Florence at the time of uh, Machiavelli. And maybe from that, we can learn that even though some of our leaders might have moral problems, we can still have very moral, productive, and wonderful lives. But uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, remember, next week, Joe Cox at the Benson Hotel, not here. Thank you for coming. Thank you.